Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. We have one of my favorite guests to speak to, such a knowledgeable guest on the entire coffee production chain, on harvesting, on roasting, on cultivation, on just about everything. Ildi Revy is on the phone. How are you doing, Ildi? Hello, Jordan. Thank you for having me again. Always appreciate it. Really excited to talk today about something that's huge in the coffee world, something that's huge in the purity coffee world, roasting profiles, roasting curves, the methods and strategies which roasters use to roast their coffee. You can do it at different temperatures, you can do it at different lengths, and that all has an effect on the health of your coffee. So Ildi, I want to dive into this with you today. First, let's start with some terminology. Can you kind of define what a roasting profile is, what a roasting curve is, what all that means? Well, when a roaster gets their green coffee, and green coffee is the raw product that they receive from the farm or their importer. When they have chosen the green coffee, they have sample roasted it. So they have an idea of what the flavors are in the coffee. And most roasters roast to bring out flavors in the coffee. At Pretty Coffee, roast differently. We Mm -hmm. Some of the chemical properties of the coffee content, the chlorogenic acids, and how much chlorogenic acid is Mm -hmm. in the coffee. Affecting the health. So a general way a roaster gets a coffee is they have their roasting machine and there are many, many different types of roasting machines in the industry. And they have a standard roast that they start off with, with every bean that they get. And it's going to be based on how they chose the green coffee to purchase anyway. So some coffees are going, you know, right away are more delicate and have delicate flavors. and so. When you do your first roast, mm. when you receive the coffee, you, you tend to apply a certain roast protocol to it. Interesting. If they're dense or heavier bean or something, you're going to do something different. But, but most roasters have a standard way that they start and they have an idea in mind when they receive the coffee. And if they roast it, they'll figure out their how much coffee to first put into the machine, how to apply the heat and how length of time, when to change the heat. And that's their protocol. When they finally get it right, they have many roasters have digital graph profiles so that they can see what's happening on a a graph that time on the bottom uh, axis on the X axis and temperature on the Y axis. So you can see what's happening in the roaster. And when they finally get the curve that they like, that's what they call their roast curve. And then they can follow that curve every time. So when a roaster first approaches a coffee, they may roast it in their machine at least three times, really, unless they nail it the first time. But they'll roast it and they'll say, "Mm, well, maybe it needs to, I, I seem to have muted the acidity. So let me go a little bit faster at the front end and take it out a little mm. bit. They'll roast that and they'll taste that and they'll be like, man, eh, now it's too acidic. I've seen the loss of sugars, you know, and so on. So that's the way they approach it. The call is, or the profile is how they determine what they want out of the, the bean and what they want the profile to be. And the curve is what they follow in the roaster mm-hmm. to make sure that they be consistent from roast to roast because ultimately it's a consumer product and people want the same thing every time. Yeah, a consistent product. It's interesting to note that every single harvest and every single you know species in different farm reacts differently. But I want to ask, what are these curves? Do they usually look the same? Is it usually like one upward arc is just different sizes? You know what I mean? Or are they really quite different in that some go up and down? Are they mostly uniform but different sizes? What do they look like? Well, there is a general curve that pretty much all of them follow. Although that said, some of these advanced roasting systems by the large companies that use uh, continuous roasters, are, it's a different thing. Mm. But the way most roasters, especially craft roasters, are, they put the coffee in at a temperature somewhere I would say between 300 and 
75 up to 425 degrees. I wouldn't put it in any higher than that. Now put it in at that high temperature. So the curve will start out where it's on the plot at zero minutes at a high temperature. Immediately, the temperature in the drum will go down because you've put in these cooler beans into the temperature. So it'll fall pretty rapidly. It'll bottom out around one and a half to two minutes. Well, I mean, all of these things depend on the size of the roaster. And then it'll start to climb up until the coffee hits what we call first crack. And what that is, it's sort of like popcorn popping. Mm. Yeah. Is that when I see the crack in the bottom of the bean there and it's all yeah. fissured? So it, the bean expands during roasting. So the first crack is usually around 390 degrees, roughly. And then after the first crack, there are continu- additional changes that can take place. Usually when you're applying heat after the first crack, between the first crack and then coffee actually usually will crack a second time and Mm. you're getting your more roast flavors like smokiness or you get what we call charring reactions as you get into the the darker roast. And do you find that most roasters over roast their coffee? Like on average, if you just grab a random bag of coffee, do you, do you find that it's usually over roasted? It's all over the place, Jordan. And it's funny you bring that up because there's a reaction now in the specialty industry where people don't want to be that over roast. So they're under their coffee. They're bringing their coffee all I, at, at these very light roasted, I mean, even lighter than you would sample roast your coffee. Some people like that. It, it's very acidic at those lighter roasts. And I don't feel like they've developed the coffee well enough in many. Interesting. Ways. Occasionally, I'll taste a light roast that that's really what should be done to that bean. Usually, I, I will taste a light roast and think, ah, they didn't caramelize their sugar. We took it out. They stalled the roast, something like that. Uh, that's so cool that you understand all those processes. I do have opinions when I drink coffee now, at least, but it's cool that you can pinpoint it to the different factors. But to stick with the average roasters, what are they roasting for? Are they roasting? I mean, obviously, they're, they're more concerned with taste than, say, a company like Purity or, or some other health conscious coffee. But again, are they kind of like following the trends? Like, oh, a lot of people are over roasting. So let's go this way. Exactly. What is is the average roasters like really aiming for when they're creating profiles? Yeah, they're roasting for taste. Mm -hmm. And when you're roasting for taste, there's a critical point in the roast and it's called the Maillard reaction. It's with any and it's a browning reaction. Toast has a Maillard reaction. Um, Potato chips, any bread, anything. It goes from oh, so like any cooked, like yes. yeah, crisped up food, exactly. And it's critical in roasting, and it starts in the coffee around 300, just roughly 300 degrees Fahrenheit, about 150. Oh, that's lower than I would imagine. Yeah, 300 is when the Maya that's when you just start seeing coffee go from green to yellowing, it starts and then it goes to brown. And this is critical because this is the first, the heat stage where what you do temperature wise is really going to impact the chemicals that are inside the coffee. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Yeah. It contains hundreds of aromatic compounds and how fast fly, how much heat is everything your outcome will be in roasting. It's that's all roasting mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. And, and the main choices a roaster has to make is how much heat do I, I apply, how quickly. So you could have a roast, and we've done this test before, where we tried to match roasts. We did a test just a few uh, weeks ago with a bunch of roasters who got together. And we had a roast done in a Loring roaster, and it was a given curve in a given profile. And in two other types of machines that are not Loring, so Loring is a smokeless 
air roaster. It's not a drum roaster. There's no direct flame touching the metal. And mm. so it's not like fried coffee. Whereas a lot of roasts. There's like a double boiler sort of thing. Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's air. It's hot air. It's more like a massive corn popper mm. versus, oh. yeah, imagine doing popcorn on a stove in a frying cook. Yeah. In an air pot. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and you actually, it tastes different, doesn't it? That those popcorn well, coffee also tastes different depending on the machine. So we took this coffee from that was done in the Loring. And then we used two different types of other roasters. One roaster has a ceramic plate with a gas flame. So the entire plate heats up. It's called an infrared roaster. So it's like distributed heat. And then we did a roaster where it was just like a gas flame next to the metal drum. Uh And we asked these roasters to try and match the roast of the Loring. And they did really well Mm -hmm. in a color analyzer. And they were just within one point difference of each other, really, which is very close. It's, It's virtually the same thing. So they nailed it on color. Well, we took the coffee and we ground it whole bean. And the difference of color in once we ground it, some of them had roasted it too fast and they ended up at the same color, but the inside was oh, undercooked. Wow. Some of it roasted the same color, but they had drawn out the so long that they had basically roasted out the acidity. And the color seemed kind of uniform. The coffee was flat and lost a whole bunch of flavor. Wow. And then even more fun, we sent these roasts where they nailed it, where it was almost the exact same as the Loring, both inside and out. We sent some acrylamide testing. Mm. And the Loring, as expected, had a low acrylamide, this 180, which is, which is really good. Uh, level of acrylamide for coffee. Mm -hmm. The exact same other coffees that look the same and roasted the same, and actually we cupped them and they tasted the same. The acrylamide in one of the other coffees was 100 points higher, even though it looked and tasted and was roasted the same. Mm. Isn't that interesting? It's just so, so complex, the chemical reactions and, and uh, chains that occur during the during the heating process. I mean, this is something you've mentioned before, right? It's not just there's a certain amount of compounds that go up and down. There are compounds constantly being created and destroyed during the roasting process, right? Yep. And some of them, particularly the things that most matter to our taste are acids and sugars. There are lo- lots of sugars. They're reducing sugars like glucose. Mm and the lactose, things like that. And there's also sucrose in coffee. So the Meyer reaction is a reaction with amino acids and reducing sugars. And that happens around 310 degrees Fahrenheit. That is interesting stuff. Yeah. So that's that, those, are the, those are the taste differentiators. Yeah. Let's talk about the health differentiators, if you would like. So the health, so I talked about acrylamide. And there's been a lot of, news about acrylamide lately. Right. Acrylamide is hullabaloo. <laughs> yeah. It's a chemical that naturally forms in any starchy food product during high temperature cooking, whether frying, baking, roasting. And it starts depending on the substance at 248 degrees Fahrenheit is when it can start to be produced. And it's related to the Meyer reaction. So we have our reducing sugars and amino acids um, mainly one called asparagine that are naturally present in many foods. Mm-hmm. A main source of acrylamide in the diet are potato products like chips, French fries. Frozen French fries are through the roof compared to a cup of coffee, right? But it's still, if you're, st- if you're trying to maximize the health of the coffee, you want as little of that stuff and as much as the, as the good stuff as you can, right? We just don't want it, but there's no way to avoid it. If you otherwise just, well, you can't, cooked food mm. like now everyone would love to say acrylamide free but what you're saying is that's not possible well not if you ever want to eat a piece of toast or cereal or <laughs> you know or a cup of coffee yeah yeah a cup of coffee so look at high levels and we're talking high levels 
acrylamide is considered a neurotoxin. And, and studies have shown it can be carcinogenic. So when we roast the coffee, we want to roast it as, to have as little acrylamide as is possible. It's never going to be acrylamide free. The thing about this is the acrylamide is actually in the lighter roasted coffees. Mm. Acrylamide starts to be destroyed once you hit a medium roast. We were talking about first ah. and second crack. First crack is when uh, water vapor is being released. Second crack is when the cells uh, and carbon dioxide start to be released from the coffee. After first crack, once you just are about to hit second crack, which can be anywhere from about 400 to, it really depends on the roasting. But let's just say roughly around 415 degrees. At that point, the acrylamide starts to go away. Mm -hmm. So we do want to get the coffee into or just up to and beyond the second. Once mm -hmm. you start going further, you're going to get darker roasted coffees. And if you get two dark roasted coffees, you're dealing with PAHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are also not good for you. And they are similar in the sense that they're also found in lots of cooked, like a well done steak with the burnt outside has, exactly. has the PAH on it. Um, lots of cooked foods contain that, yep. uh, that carcinogen, right? Especially grilling. You're going to get that. And it's just not good for you. Although it's funny because charcoal tablets, don't they, when they're detoxing? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that's about, really. <laughs> well, to ask Dr. Ernst, uh, detox specialist. Yeah, yeah I, I do want to ask them. So there's a sweet spot where you can get the lowest level of acrylamide. And it, it, it happens to be just around the medium rose. So a medium roasted coffee in general, I would say is the best mm -hmm. for you. And medium is, uh, I mean, it's hard to describe what medium is. It's just that nice coffee color where you can see if you get beans, beans are smoother on the outside with lighter roasts. They can be modeled more like, you know, calico looking beans. Mm. And the funny thing about the light roast is this. If the roaster is applying the heat too quickly they're roasting they're getting that first crack they're taking it out at a light roast if they're using a drum roaster if they've applied the heat too much heat too quickly you'll see on the outside like inspect your beans look at them you'll see on the outside little dark brown patches on the beans and that's where the bean was hitting the drum and so some of these are getting overcooked so you're getting mm. some what we call roasty notes in the coffee at the same time you're getting that high acidity and and some people think it tastes balanced but really it's just a, a really poorly roasted coffee wow where, interesting it's kind of like an uneven cooked steak yeah we call that scorching in coffee is when you see you know parts of the bean are darker than like noticeably burnt or dark. right because it was making contact with a with the heated surface that makes sense Let's talk about the healthy compounds, though, and how that's affected. I mean, I know CGAs are very present in light roasted coffees, and I know you can destroy them by over roasting. But why do you want to land in that middle mark? I suppose you can always have another cup if you're looking for more CGAs. So did you guys have to kind of find that balance between a, a light, high CGA roast and then the medium so-called perfect medicinal roast? Yes. Got that down. <laughs> <laughs> And really what, what it is, is that acids are being formed throughout the roast. But what we're, we're talking really about is chlorogenic acid, which is different than citric acid or malic, phosphoric, acetic. All of these other acids happen in coffee as well. Chlorogenic acid is a polyphenol that is good for you and it will be destroyed the darker you roast it so if you're drinking a very dark roasted coffee or even a dark roasted coffee the chlorogenic acids are likely to have been destroyed mm. on the other side again remember if we roasted too light to keep those chlorogenic acids they may be high 
but also you're going to be high in all the other acids. So citric acid and malic acid uh-huh. are prevalent in coffee as well. And those are the things that taste sour in coffee. And they're destroyed by the end of first crack when you're getting into second crack. The, the levels of citric and malic acid have gone down significantly. Mm. Yep. And, um, and so that's a sort of telltale sign, even though the acidity is high. So you're going to be dealing with that uh, acrylamide issue if you're going too light. That's fascinating stuff. And then other, uh, so if you're, if you're, for instance, trying to keep a lower acidity coffee for those who may have a sensitive stomach or something, you bump it up a little bit, which is counterintuitive. You cook it more to make it a little easier on the stomach. Interesting stuff. Very interesting. Well, the acidity in coffee, it's funny because we looked into that and I never want to deny if somebody feels like coffee is giving them heartburn. There's definitely something going on there. It's not, it may not be the acidity. Studies have shown it's actually not the, the acidity. It's the pH. Wow. That coffee. doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, it may it be certainly be the mold. pesticides. <laughs> well, mold, mold, pesticides okay. could be or mold, or it could be, um, but not with, uh, with purity. Um, it could be the oils in the coffee. Mm-hmm. Oily, yeah. Yeah. And so they're they're causing more bile to be produced, which enters the stomach and then makes you feel like you're getting hungry. So this is the most widely consumed beverage behind water, and we've been drinking it forever, and we're, there's still so much unknown about it. Are you just – are you happy to be inundated in this stuff? You're like a coffee wizard. You're like – um you're like it's like you're a coffee whisperer and everyone drinks it but no one knows anything about it it's a fascinating subject right it's fascinating and it's very difficult jordan to study because roasting machines are closed systems that it's very difficult to pull a coffee out let's say you get a a, a certain coffee from columbia or whatever and you say i want to know exactly what's happening chemically to this coffee throughout the entire thing You'll pull it out at certain levels. Again, how you're applying the heat at what speed and how much. What you do one time, pulling it out at a, like at 12 minutes or, or seven minutes or whatever and seeing what chemicals. Right. Yeah, that's a tough one. If you're not doing it exactly the same the next time, you're going to get a different reading uh, at that seven minutes. Mm-hmm. And well, just that one Colombian coffee. We have dozens and dozens of origins with coffee being produced, uh, different varieties of coffee. In different climates, with different methods. And a different rainfall, different drying methods, different processing, different lengths of time is shipping. So it's actually so difficult to study coffee and what it's doing in the roaster. And, and there, are, there are some studies on roasting. But they're just a snapshot of coffees during a certain amount of time. And they really and and they're not repeatable. That's the other thing is science likes to repeat things. So you can't double check somebody's work on something because that coffee is gone. Yeah, that's a really good point. And meanwhile, billions of cups are sold. So it's very difficult to study this stuff. And that's why our senses are important and um, using a lab. We have a lab that we, you know, spot check the coffees. And, mm. the, and that's why having the curve is very important because if you follow the curve and you're using the same coffee, you should get the same, pretty much the same results. But also as the coffee ages, a coffee, same coffee in January is going to roast differently if it's still around in October. And it'll roast differently in the humidity of August in South Carolina than it does in December. So, so interesting. Yeah. Well, we love that you're pushing the science. I know you got to wrap it up here in about 15 minutes. You got a heart out. So let's just drop a little bit of science before we end the episode here. Let's talk specifics. Let's talk numbers. When you are putting together the perfect roasting curve, what are you looking for in terms of, let's say, do you have rules of thumb that you would never go higher than this temperature or longer than this length? Anyone who does that is over roasting. You mentioned a medium roast being nice, but can you give us some numbers and some general things of what you're looking for when you're putting together the perfect curve? Yes, I can give ideas, but that's part of the- Am I digging into proprietary? 
part of the secret. Ah. That said, I can tell you a few things. First thing is if a roaster is going over 450 degrees, um, like if you're getting, so when we, we look at the temperature, we have the environment that the coffee is being roasted in. And then we have the actual bean temperature and how they temperatures. These beans are usually hitting a thermocouple that's, you know, they're ba- bashing up against this little metal thermocouple that's in the roaster. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and these are with drum roasters, air roasters are different. And so if the, the bean temperature, like if the above 450 degrees, like you're, you're getting hot there. Thumbs down, um, thumbs down from Ildi. Yep. And definitely what roasting the curve, we don't want to roast it too fast because we want it properly cooked inside. And we don't want to roast it too slowly because number one, we're going to be destroying those healthy compounds throughout the, um, you know, the longer it's supposed mm-hmm. to heat. And the other thing is if we, if we roast too long at too low a temperature, if the curve is too shallow, you just sort of roast out. There's nothing interesting left. All the nuances. Interesting. Uh, but, yeah. but the other thing is I look at coffee, the whole beans, and you can tell a lot by looking at the beans. They, they look very uniform when, when you, you know, pour them into your grinder before you grind, but pull them out and look at them all and give them a really good look. And you'll see whether something's roasted properly or there, there's something that you can question about it. So that's pretty much what I can tell you there. <laughs> Without giving away any company secrets. I got one more question before we hop off here. Actually, I just want to talk about looking at a, a bag of coffee and kind of knowing the roast, you know, I'm sure that you, you have so much insight, but even I can tell, you know, I'm used to purity. Sometimes when I pop open a bag, the beans are black and covered like shimmery covered in oil. And I'm like, this has to have, there's gotta be something wrong with this. I assume over roasted. Can you just give us a little insight on that? Well, I hope that's not a purity bag. You've opened and seen that. Absolutely not. No, that's a different, <laughs> that's, that's when my purity's out and I go to whole foods and I grab something yeah. random and I go, what's this? Well, it was really funny once when I was, a. Uh, I had a roasting company at one time and I had this beautiful coffee and I I gave it to a new accountant and said, why are the beans so dry looking? There's something wrong with them. They're too dry. (laughs) They should be oily. And I just thought, oh no. Anyway, I didn't get the accountant because I wasn't going to really do that. (laughs) But but was I on track there? That's an over roast. What happens is these beans, they're beans. They're, they're the seed of, plant so they're full of nutrition they're meant to be to provide nutrition for that seedling as it's growing right and what comes so it's full of oil right and as you roast the cells the, the coffee expands and at first crack when you hear the it, it's the crack of the cellulose of the cells just breaking open it and it's it's water that is boiled and it's breaking out so this is big mm is released and then the coffee starts to dry out in the roaster and then at second crack it breaks open again and when it breaks open some of the oil starts to rise to the surface of the beans Mm -hmm. and you have a super oily coffee you know that it's been roasted so that it well into second crack and the oils are just emerging and those oils I mean, some of them look very nice, but that coffee, when it's exposed to air, goes rancid much more quickly. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, which is why we pack coffee and nitrogen packing. This is a whole other podcast about how to prevent staling. Yeah, great information on your last episode about, so, about that. Um, we have res- rancidity with exposure to oxygen and staling if the coffee sits too long. I said it before, I love the purity coffee cure, the dry, the whatever the process is, because it ends up like a delicious bowl of cereal. I just want to pour a bunch of milk in my bag and eat it like cereal. <laughs> but then I'll say, but then I'll say the other side, I've really only been exposed to one, one brand of under roasted specialty coffee. And, and it was a light roast. They were all proud of their light roast. And looking at those beans, it was totally different. They were almost visibly, like you said, like a calico color. Uh, it's almost like you could see the green still in them. Yeah, you can see that. 
on the outside. So a good medium roasted coffee is going to be that nice sort of pecan colored brownish coffee. Mm-hmm. And you may see a few like glints of oil here and there on it as it, from some of the cells, but, but it shouldn't be oily, but you will see a little bit of oil emerging beans occasionally. Love it, Ildi. This has been fantastic. Um, Thank you so much. You're always a pleasure to speak to, and you're welcome back anytime. Thanks, Jordan. Let's talk about brewing sometime. Yes, brewing. Something that I can get my head around and enjoy. Yeah, we'll do an episode on brewing coming up soon. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate each and every one of you. This is Ildi Revy and Jordan River signing off, wishing you a great day. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Mm